So let's start with the neoclassical age. So we have completed Chaucer's age, Spencer's age, then uh, yeah, 17th century, uh, ranging from metaphysical poet to John Milton. Now we are about to discuss 18th century uh, neoclassical age. Neoclassical age is also known as Augustan age. Okay, so let's see why the age is known as Augustan age. So 18th century hmm, uh, in English literature uh, is called as Augustan age or the classical age or the neoclassical age in English literature. But the golden period of English literature is oh, Queen Elizabeth period, Elizabeth era, era. Okay, and this neoclassical age can be divided into two periods. Okay, age of Pope and age of Dryden. So age of Dryden from, you know, um, <clears throat> from 16, yeah, 1658 to somewhat around first half of the 17, not first half of the 17th century, first half of the 18th century. Okay. Thereafter from 1700 to 1745, it is known as the age of Pope. So, you know, 18th century witnessed Hmm? Three major figures. One is Dryden, another one is Pope, and another one is Samuel Johnson. Okay, three of them are critics. And let me tell you, John Dryden is known as the father of English criticism. John Dryden is known as the father of English criticism. And this person has lived through 17th century and 18th century, first half of the 18th century. Okay. Uh, even though he, uh, you know, uh, John Dryden, he belonged to the 17th century. He also lived through the 18th century. Yeah. And why this period is known as Augustine? Let's see. You know, um, see, Emperor Augustus. It is during Emperor Augustus period, you know, well versed writers like Ovid, Horace, hmm, Virgil, or flourished. Hmm? He is a Roman emperor. Now, so during their time, the Roman, I mean, the Roman literature reached its pinnacle. Okay. And, you know, uh, in English literature, uh, in 18th century, writers of this period, they imitated ancient Roman writers, ancient Roman and Italian writers. Okay. They followed their tradition, rules meters rhythm etc they closely followed like everything that is why this period is known as neoclassical age neoclassical period augustan age is known as the classical period hmm? because i told you why the reason is virgil horace ovid and other eminent writers flourished during the period of emperor augustus okay and that period was revived in uh, england in 18th century Okay, that is why the name is uh, applied as neoclassical age. <clears throat> One second. Now, so the period is also known as the period of Dryden and Pope. And yeah, I have all, uh, already discussed why this period is known as, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> neoclassical age. Now, yeah, the common features of neoclassical period. So whenever you get a question from block five uh, regarding uh, <clears throat> Matt Flecknow or episode of Dr. Albert Knott, you have to see whether the particular poetry or particular poem uh, has followed all these traditions. Okay, so 15th century, uh, see, we have, start, uh, we have studied Chaucer's poetry. This is the Chaucer's poem. Canterbury Tales, uh, that is the kind of social satire. Then we discuss Spencer's poetry, that is full of, you know, uh, high, uh, oh, yeah, overflowing emotion, romance hmm, kind of stuff. And, you know, Elizabethan period, hmm? see work during, yeah, the work written during Elizabethan, Elizabethan period is overwhelmed with these kind of overflowing passions. And thereafter uh, comes the meta metaphysical poets. So, you know, metaphysical poets, they were against the immediate ancestors' tradition. Usually, if you check in the English literature, hmm, yeah, if you check with the English literary phases, you can see that all, the, all these successors were against the immediate ancestors, their tradition. 
uh, and the successor uh, had a tendency to follow the traditions of their long gone ancestors, not their immediate uh, predecessors, but long, long, long uh, dead ancestors. That means, uh, see, these people hmm, of 18th century, they follow the tradition of the uh, yeah uh, writers who lived in 2nd century BC and all. Okay. Yeah. So these people were against the traditions of Elizabethan era. And uh, love and other kind of stuff were, uh, yeah, love and other kind of stuff have no place in their works. So this period is known as the era of enlightenment. Mm, they emphasize logic and reason. Uh, so their work, you know, they, uh, it lacked in passion and emotion. And, you know, basically the very theme of their work is around country life, mm, politics, country life. So all those stuff outside the town life or outside the... <clears throat> city life is considered you know pretty unrefined and indecent now so these poets uh, apart from that you know there were so many clubs coffee houses clubs where the uh, eminent writers used to gather discuss about the politics of the day or whatever i hope you know that uh, england during that time period from 17th century to uh, 19th century England was politically unrest because England has witnessed, uh, yeah, the reign, the uh, yeah, reign of several kings. So yeah, England was politically unrest. So these king, these people, uh, divided into two groups. That is Whigs and Tories. Whigs were the group of people who supported Parliament, and Tories were the group of people supported royal monarchy. Okay. And parliamentarians were Protestants. Uh, I mean, those people who supported royal authorities were Roman Catholics. Okay, so there was a conflict between Whigs and Tory from 17th century to late 18th century. You can see that. Okay, the nation was divided into two, Whigs and Tories. So, you know, uh, they were mostly interested in politics and other kind of stuff, not love or rural themes. So their language is full of artificiality. And these men were mm, men of letters, learned men, unlike uh, our Shakespeare mm, uh, and other uneducated writers. Mm, uh, these men were men of letters, highly educated letters and uh, people of mm, mannerism. Okay, so they use bombastic language. They are not uh, the writers of ordinary people, commonplace people. Only a well, uh, well, uh, I mean, well learned person can uh, read and understand their works. Okay, uh, yeah. So, life, other kind of you know, passion, emotion, or humanistic feelings were what they were. Poetry was devoid of humanistic feelings. Okay, now, uh, unlike in Elizabethan and in Spenserian poetry, uh, you know, there is no love of nature, landscape, or country things in their poem. And the major work of the neoclassical period is, hmm, the, yeah, the major works of the neoclassic period were satires, satires, lampoon, burlesque, farce, etc. Mostly pamphlets, etc. Okay, now let's see, what are the common features of neoclassical period? So their work, mm, we can see comments, uh, the work were often underlined with common sense, accuracy, structure. And, you know, these men, you know, they adhered on strict rules uh, upon meters, rhythm. They followed heroic couplet, iambic pentameters and all. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I already told you what uh, the major literary product of the periods were novel, essays, diaries, letters, satire etc now so these work hmm, had the features like objectivity impersonality impersonality means devoid of human characters or human traits okay full of principles and all rationality decorum balance harmony so they struggled to maintain all these you know strict rules in their work rather than rendering a piece of rather than rendering what do you call a kind of um, solace or entertainment to uh, readers, they struggle to maintain these type of uh, qualities 
in their work. And uh, yeah, they maintain the three unities. Yeah, they closely, they, these writers try to maintain the three unities. I hope you are already familiar with the three unities of Aristotle as you are uh, familiar with literary criticism. First block, you have studied, yeah, in first block, you have studied Plato and Aristotle, right? So according to Plato, poetry is thrice removed from reality. Why is poetry thrice removed from reality? Because original world, the, yeah, the original idea, Hmm, the uh, the exist in the ex external world or the one that we see around with our eyes, isn't it? That is the original world. It is from the nature that we draw ideas, isn't it? That's the first world. First copy is nature. And the second copy is the image that we perceive in our head. Hmm? That is the second copy, That's something that we perceive. And the third copy is that we put in paper. So first of all, a writer hmm, will look at nature for his materials. Thereafter, he will imbibe the ideas then he will work uh, in his mind so the mind is the chemical factory you know the mind is the chemical factory where all kind of ideas and stuff are formed so that is the second processing unit and the third unit is the paper so that is why so you know uh, when we take the first copy hmm, it will be clear but again if you take a second copy from the already uh yeah, Xerox copy, it will be, you know, it won't be that, uh, that that bright. It will be a little bit dimmed. Then, again, if you're taking the copy of a, the second Xerox copy, it will be much more uh, dimmed, isn't it? Similarly, uh, Plato said that poetry is thrice removed from reality. Okay, now, so the common features of uh, the work written during 18th century is they imitated hmm? they imitated the ancient writers imitation so these writers believe that imitation hmm? uh, is the first and foremost quality why these writers imitated ancient writers now especially uh, alexander pope and john dryden they translated the works of homer and virgil okay now Let's discuss about John Dryden. So I told you John Dryden is the prominent figure of the 17th and 18th century. He lived through 1631 to 1700. First half of the 17th century, really he, uh, no, first half of the 18th century, really he died. So yeah, he was an English poet, literary critic, translator, playwright, etc. So the first poet laureate the first official poet laureate of England is John Dryden. He became the poet laureate in 1668. Please note that. Now, <laughs> he was called Glorious John by Sir Walter Scott. I hope you know Walter Scott. Walter Scott is the father of historical novel. Yeah, Walter Scott is known as the father of historical novel. So he called John Dryden the Glorious John. And Dr. Samuel Johnson called him the father of English criticism. Okay. He's the one who uh, taught criticism to people, English people. Okay, that means the first uh, one to teach people to determine the merit of the composition. Okay, he's the first one to teach uh, English people how to determine the <coughs> quality of a work upon certain principles. These principles were written by hmm, Aristotle, Plato, and other writers of the uh, ancient period. So these people stick on to their rules, and uh, with those rules, they judge the work of their contemporaries whatever so but you know even though Dryden was a versatile writer his greatest achievement uh you know uh, lie in his satirical works yeah so he has translated the works of Horace Juvenile Ovid Lucretius Theocritus etc all right so we have already seen Theocritus in the last class because Theocritus is the, uh, is the originator of pastoral energies okay now so Dryden, uh, let me tell you, Dryden is an opportunist. Hmm? Several times he has changed his objectives and views with the uh, changing rulers of the country. Hmm? Yeah, that is why his uh, political views are very shifting, very changing. Okay, uh, at first he followed Charles I, thereafter he followed Oliver Cromwell, again he followed Charles II, then James II, then he remained uh, loyal to James II. Okay, that is why he lost his quiet laureateship in uh 1688 okay fine now 
1660, you know, uh, Dryden celebrated the reign of Charles, King Charles II with extra products. Roy, yeah. So uh, last class, mm, uh, yeah, in the third class, I have told you that Charles I was beheaded in 1649. Thereafter, who came into the throne? Oliver Cromwell came into the throne and he reigned England till 1660. After that, after his death, who came? Charles II came. So Oliver Cromwell was a Protestant king. Thereafter, Charles II was restored to the monarchy. He was exiled in France. So these English people, though these royal people, uh, brought, yeah, <coughs> they brought him back to England. Along with him, he brought uh, the mannerisms, the French mannerisms hmm, uh, in England. So that is why the period is known as restoration, restoring Charles II to the monarchy. So until 1660, he was supporting Oliver Cromwell. When Charles II became the king of England, he started supporting Charles II. So that is why he, uh, I said uh, he, his political views hmm, were, you know, quite pretty changing one he was he had fluctuating political views wavering mind okay so anyway sam uh, john bryden being such a uh prof yeah prolific writer prolific uh, efficient writer samuel johnson tried to justify uh him see if bryden had ever changed then he had changed with the nation it was a need of the time hmm? nation to uh, even the nation has changed then what's wrong with the dryden if he changed, he changed with the nation. Okay, that's how he defended and justified John Bryden in his book, Lives of the Poet. So, Bryden, yeah. So I told you he supported Charles I, then Oliver Cromwell, then Charles II, thereafter James II. And he remained loyal to James II. You know, uh, after, uh, soon after the, um, the reign of Charles II, there was a rift. There was a conflict. Uh, so has to me. Uh, so has to decide who's the next king of uh, England. So some uh, Whigs wanted to make, you know, uh, the illegit illegitimate son of Charles II as the, the next uh, successor of, yeah, the next king of England. But royal people they wanted to make James II the rightful or uh, the brother of Charles II. The next king of England. So that was the reason for the rift between Whigs and Tories. And since Dryden supported James II, after the reign of James II, he lost his poet laureateship. Okay. Now, the one that is prescribed in your syllabus in, in block five is Mac Fleckno. Mac Fleckno and Alexander Sweets, piece by John Dryden. So, Mac Flecknow is the first satire, mock satire in English literature. Okay, written by John Dryden, written in heroic couplet. Okay, and he is the one who is, uh, you know, credited with the standardizing heroic couplet. Even though heroic couplet was first uh, employed by, employed in English by Chaucer, it was perfected by John Dryden. So, in the first class, I have told you, uh, who who is the father of English poetry? Geoffrey Chaucer is the father of Eng uh, English poetry because he standardized English, isn't it? He standardized English, and uh, he has introduced several metrical schemes in English. But John Dryden is the first person who perfected it, who has taken it to a different level. <clears throat> now discuss Mac Flecknoe. So Mac Flecknoe. A satire upon the full title is a satire upon the true blue protestant ts ts is none but thomas shadwell a contemporary and friend of uh john dryden later he became the you know uh his enemy yeah Written, yeah, it is written in around 1678 anyway this uh post yeah any uh it was published anonymously in 1682, there were the and there, there were several reasons for publishing it anonymously because you know the political condition were not that good during um uh, yeah during that period political condition was not that good. So the meaning of the word Mac Fleckno is son of Fleckno, son of Fleckno, and uh, Fleckno is here yeah, Richard Fleckno. Okay, son of Fleckno means uh yeah here it is Thomas Shadwell. 
simply said because uh, actually Thomas Shabell has nothing to do with Richard Flecknoe. Richard Flecknoe is an Irish poetaster. Poetaster means you know somebody of uh, inept writing abilities, not that good, not uh, uh, not that matured in writing, but a poetaster. I hope you know the meaning of poet poetaster, not a flourished writer, one who is writing for his sisters, the sake of his stomach or to um, uh, make money. Such type of poets are called poetasters. So that is why Thomas Sharpel is said to be, it's a mock satire, right? So here, John Dryden is trying to mock Thomas Sharpel. So let's see <coughs> uh, this, what a mock satire is. Okay, uh, then. So in this poem, we can see that uh, it's a direct attack upon Thomas Shadwell. And after John Dryden, Thomas Shadwell became the poet laureate hmm, in England. Uh, re reason is J Dryden was a Roman Catholic. Hmm? He supported to uh, Tories, whereas Thomas Shadwell is a Protestant. Hmm? Uh, Protestant poet who supported Parliament, Whigs. Okay, now... There had been a rivalry between Dryden and Thomas Shadwell, uh, but Thomas Shadwell, you know, he does, uh, yeah, he never, he didn't follow those strict rules of ancient writers. But you know, Dryden was mostly obsessed with following the rhyme, metrical scheme, heroic uh, couplet, etc. By 18th century, the tradition of heroic couplet uh, has become subsided, and other writers, prominent writers, started to write in blank verse. So, you know, Dryden has become an old, outdated hmm, poet by the time hmm, Thomas Shadwell uh, started to write. So, you know, uh, uh, other Protestant poet and two uh, Whigs, they started to ridicule Dryden in their works. So I told you uh, these people were good friends. That means Dryden and Thomas Shadwell were good friends until... The nation split into two. That is Wicks and Tories. I told you the reason behind the rivalry is but Wicks wanted to make uh, Charles II's illegitimate son, uh, <coughs> Duke of Monmouth, the next king of England, whereas Tories wanted to make the legitimate brother of Charles II, who was a Roman Catholic, the next king. That is James II. This is the reason for the rivalry or the conflict between Dryden and Thomas Shadwell, even though that was a silly uh, public issue, that uh, they have taken it to the next level and became a personal issue. Okay, so Wicks were led by Chancellor Earl of Shaftesbury. Hmm? So, you know, Wicks people brought a bill in Parliament, uh, so has to exclude Roman Catholic Duke of York, that is James II, in succeed, uh, succeeding uh, his brother Charles II. And uh, these Whigs wanted to make Duke of Monbau, uh, yeah, illegitimate son of Charles II, the next successor. Anyway, uh, <coughs> Tories also fought over the issue. So Bryden went over to Tory, Shadwell to Whigs. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So, you know, they started. So there were so many poets uh, among Whigs and Tories. So, you know what they did? They started to write poems against one another. Hmm? If a Tory people are writing poem against Wicks one day, next day they will come up with uh, another um, burlesque against Tory. So they started to throw stones at each other, you know, uh, in the form of poetry, pamphlets, satires, like that. They ridiculed each other. So you know what happened? Um, this Wicks uh, ridiculed Dryden in their first work came out in 1671, the rehearsal. Yeah, in the rehearsal, uh, yeah, the prominent big writers, they ridiculed Dryden and his massive appearance. You know something? John Dryden, Thomas Shadwell, Ben Johnson. Yeah. All these writers were formidable, physically very big, okay? So, uh, apart Dryden, I told you, he's pretty old fashioned. He, he's pretty old fashioned and he still maintained his strict rules and rigid rhythms, even in a period where it has lost its importance. Okay. So, uh, yeah. These Wix people ridiculed his obsessive, obsessiveness for heroic couplet in their work rehearsal. Uh, and they have given him the name Bayes in uh, 
the, the character hmm? uh, they have created they have lampooned the character of dryden under the pretext um, under the name base okay anyway the dryden didn't give a, a quick response to uh rehearsal he remained silent okay dryden remained silent then he published absalom and achitophel okay in absalom and achitophel uh he criticized he caricatured shaftsbury because shaftsbury is the person who led the wicks okay he attacked shaftsbury there are after he also attacked shaftsbury in the medal okay so in response to the rehearsal actually the rehearsal is the first work written by wicks ridiculing dryden his poetic tradition and his physical appearance in rehearsal okay so there have the thereafter dryden wrote uh yeah a satirical poem absalom and achitophel and medal okay so in absalom and achitophel and in uh, medal he satirized all of shasbury and thomas shadwell okay so yeah please note that medal ridiculed the triumph of wicks okay so thereafter you know these wick people they became very infuriated yeah so thomas shadwell has written has given a reply to dryden in the form of medal of john base john base uh, that is a, a name given to john dryden in their lampoons by wicks okay so in response yeah has a response to medal and achitophel thomas shadwell who is a wick uh, <coughs> attack dryden hmm, by writing medal of base okay so anyway this literary quarrel went for a pretty long period and dryden so you know uh, uh, thomas shadwell severely criticized dryden in medal of john bees and dryden hmm, he waited for some time thereafter he you know he just flowed thomas shadwell in macfleck no that was the most severest of all personal satires in english Mm, okay so we sh you should say this is the punjan sarcasm or the punjan satire ever written in english okay <laughs> thereafter he flowed thomas shadwell now let's start with map mock epic satire let's see what is mock epic satire so i already uh, told you satire is the employment of sarcasm or irony uh where the wisest follies of an individual will be praised or elevated see usually we are pretty familiar with epic ramayana mahabharata iliad odyssey you know these works writers have praised and elevated the noble noble and heroic qualities of the character in ramayana rama yeah mahabharata krishna and iliad and odyssey uh, odysseus isn't it so these writers have hmm, elevated the noble qualities of the hero where has in mock epic satire unlike you know uh, uh, instead of praising them they highlighted the follies in a grand level, level but in the same way at the same time they will be comparing the idiotic or inept idiotic inept foolish hero will be you know uh, his follies his vices uh yeah will be highlighted by comparing him to a noble character in epics so one side the writer will be uh you know praising the real mythical character on other side the lower character the uh, the subject or the target is placed you know why the target and the uh, actual heroes are placed so has to show that you know <clears throat> degree of difference oneness you know yeah one occupies the seat of that epitome and another one the seat of all type of vices follies etc okay so satire began with see all our genres uh we have inducted to ancient greeks similarly satire began with old greek dramatist and aristophanes is uh, believed to be the originator of this genre 
please remember Aristophanes is the originator of satire and Theocritus, Theocritus is the originator of pastoral elegy. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so in Mok Epic, uh, <clears throat> the trivial qualities or the, you know, all those silly uh, mistakes, hmm, vices of the hero will be elevated in an, uh, you know, yeah, will be treated as a, you know, treated in a heroic level or in a heroic manner. Okay. Now, so, not that Mo, Mo, Mac Fleckno is the first Greek great mock epic poem ever written in English, and the most popular one is the Rape of Locke, written by Alexander Pope. Now, let's discuss the poem Mac Fleckno. I told you Mac Fleckno, the title, the subtitle is Satire upon the True Blue Protestant. Yes, now let's look into the, a few lines of Mac Fleckno. All human things are subject to decay. And when the fate summons, monarch must obey. This Flecknoe farm, who, like Augustus Young, was called to empire and have governed long. So, Mac Flecknoe, the title's meaning is son of Flecknoe. Flecknoe is a Richard, uh, uh, yeah, Flecknoe is none but Richard Flecknoe, an Irish poet pastor. So, in this poem, you know, he makes Thomas Shadwell... <laughs> Yeah, liter the literary son, not the biological son, okay? He is the, according to Dryden, Thomas Shadwell is the literary son of Richard Flecknoe. So Richard Flecknoe has become quite old, uh, uh, yeah, quite bold, uh, uh, and he is, you know, presented as the king of nonsense, king of nonsensical literature, nonsensical literature. So for a quite long time, he had wrote the realm of nonsensical literature. Now he is very old. So, ha so he has to give it way to his next successor. So the Flecknoe is searching for a new king to the throne of uh, nonsensical literature. So <laughs> Dryden says that all human things are subject to decay. Isn't it? All immortal, uh, sorry, all mortal beings will die someday. Hmm? When fate calls, we will have to answer it. We will have to go. So Flecknoe is searching for his ideal successor. And so Flecknoe, just like Emperor Augustus, you know, Emperor Augustus, uh, yeah, he too had a very long life. And so just like um, actually Augustus is a very, you know, a uh, very masculine king. Mm, uh, yeah, a seat of masculinity. But, you know, Richard Flecknoe is a... I told you a poet pastor. See, see, that is what I told you. Uh, the trivial and the exalted will be compared mm, hand in hand. So has to show that difference. Show, uh, so has to heighten uh, the, what do you call, the degree of their shallowness. Okay. Uh, so just like uh, Emperor Augustus in Rome, <clears throat> mm, this person, Richard Flecknoe, has ruled quite a long period in uh, the realm of nonsensical literature. Now, time has come. He has given way to his next successor. So he is in search for that. In prose and verse, was on without dispute through all the realms of nonsense absolute. This age prince now flourishing in peace and best with the issue of large equity. Worn out with business, did at large debate to settle the uh, succession of the state. So this man has, uh, you know, ruled his country. That means realm of nonsensical literature hmm? in a best way, the best possible way. Now time has come. Uh, he needs to, uh, yeah, he needs to replace that. He, he needs to replace himself with someone better. So he's in search of that. And Pontin, which of, uh, which of all his son was fit to reign and wage mortal war with it. So now he is thinking. So he has so many children, so many inept uh, writers like him. Okay, so he's thinking, okay, who, who is the most eligible to become the next successor? Uh, to reign the wage immortal war with which cried reserve for natural place that he should only true who most resemble me. Shadwell alone my perfect image bears, mature in dullness from tender years. So uh, upon pondering for a long time, he got the answer. 
is none other than Thomas Shadwell because he is the only person who resembles me in every possible way. And that man has shown, you know, dullness from his uh, tender ears. So the quality to become the next king in the realm of nonsense is he should have perfect dullness. He should be the embodiment of perfect dullness. And who has that quality? Thomas Shadwell. You know, Thomas Shadwell has reflected or shown hmm, perfect dullness from his tender ears. Shadwell alone of all my son as he stands confirmed in all full stupidity. So this man is perfect. Hmm? Uh, and he has never deviated from the path of stupidity. Okay. Uh, rest of some pain, meaning make pretense, but Shadwell never deviate into sense. See, I too uh, have many uh, other children, but you know, they are for namesake. They are not actually idiots. They are simply pretending to be idiots. But Thomas Shadwell is not like that. He is a true idiot. He never, he has never uh, deviated hmm, uh, uh, in uh, from nonsense into uh, sense. Okay. Some beams of wit on other soul may fall, strike through and make a lucid interval. But Shadwell, genuine knight, admits no ray. His rising fox prevail upon the day and beside his godly fabric fills the eye and seems designed for thoughtless majesty. Again, he says that in the case of other writers, sometimes the, you know, the ray of intelligence may pass through their head. So, yeah, just like we say that in a dark room, uh, in a room covered with black glasses, you know, the ray of light, yeah, it will not allow the ray of light to pass through it because we know that dark color will absorb everything, isn't it? Similarly, you know, uh, Thomas Shadwell's head is, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's like a black cloud. It will not allow any ray of intelligence to pass through it. Whereas in the case of other writers, sometime they will write something sensical. They, uh, at times, some ray of light will pass through them. In the case of Thomas Shadwell, it is seldom possible. That much he is, uh, what do you call, fiddle to nonsensical literature. He will never allow any sensible thing to come into his work. So he only bears all those qualities to be the next king of nonsensical literature okay thoughtless as monarch ox the shade of the shade the plain and spread in solemn state supremely reign he would surely work but the studio, but the types of thee thou last great prophet of tautology even i a dunes uh, of more renown than thee was sent before but to prepare thy way so again he compares thomas shadwell to that of a Oak tree. So we know that oak tree will uh, reach a great height and it will spread and will uh, form a shade to other trees. Similarly, you know, Thomas Shadwell is also like that. Hmm? Uh, he's, uh, he, will, uh, he has grown into a huge tree and now he is spreading his uh, shadow of uh, what? Shadow of um, nonsense over other writers. See? Haywood and Shirley. Haywood and Shirley are characters created by Thomas Shadwell in his drama. Okay, so they are the actual replica of his writer. So uh, the Dryden says that hmm, all those works written by Thomas Shadwell, all his characters, hmm, mostly fools, hmm, resemble the resemble the nature of their writer, creator. So. And he is said to be the last prophet of tautology. Tautology means nonsense or repetition. Okay. So Thomas Shadwell is believed to be the last prophet of tautology. Why? We know that uh, who's the last prophet of Christianity? Jesus Christ. Last prophet of Buddhism. Of Buddhism Lord Buddha. L last prophet of Jain. Jainism. Vartamana Mahavira. Isn't it? So the last prophet of all religion will be the famous and the greatest one, isn't it? Similarly, who's the last prophet of tautology? Thomas Shadwell. The kind of, you know, uh, the elevated stuffs are compared along with the silly, trivial things only to show the difference in how mean or how low uh, subject the one uh, is, I mean, the Dryden is dealing with. 
okay so he says that thomas shadwell <clears throat> thomas shadwell is the last prophet of nonsense or nonsensical literature uh even i a dunes dunes means a fool of more renown than day so i means richard flecknow so richard flecknow is the narrator you know he is the narrator of this uh, mock epic poem he says that just like john the baptist john the baptist was sent on earth before jesus christ to prepare his way just like that richard flecknow was sent to earth so has to prepare the way for thomas shadwell okay so this is the first 50 uh, yeah 50 lines from Mac Fleck, no. Uh, it's pretty easy, you know. A lot of mythical comparisons. Very interesting. Yeah, overview of Mac Fleck, no. Let's see. So we have already discussed uh, the first fifty poem for fifty. Sorry, first fifty lines where the Charles Fleck, no, is searching for a, uh, you know, an ideal, I mean, successor to his throne. So. after considering many qualities of thomas Sh uh, shadwell he decides that Sh shadwell will become the uh, the next king of the uh, realm of nonsense so this person uh, he says that thomas shadwell had con uh, conducted a musical performance in front of the king and that was you know uh, he even outsurpassed or uh, surpassed his father richard flecknow okay so the next set the lines from 63 to 86 is coronation ceremony of our thomas shadwell so richard flecknow has decided to uh, coronate hmm, his son thomas shadwell so now he is uh, selecting the place of coronation so he selected nursery hmm, a place in a very notorious place in london actually in a nursery uh, you know the place is uh, not or uh, yeah the place is famous for inept writers actor actresses just like uh, we have some places in india right kodambakkam and uh, uh, <coughs> gullies in uh, mumbai kolkata yeah the place were uh, you know low profile characters hmm? where uh, where they live okay so similarly nursery is a place of uh common place people not common place people uh place where those inept writers hmm, actresses actors hmm, where they dwelled and performed so yeah very disreputable quarters of london so so many years back hmm, thomas decker thomas decker is the is an what do you call it? yeah he's a comedian elizabeth yeah he is an elizabethan comedian so long uh, long time ago he has prophesied that in this place there will come a a king who would rage you know who would wage perpetual war against sense or intelligence he is none other than thomas shadwell okay so now lines from 87 to 133 deals with the coronation ceremony of thomas shadwell so yeah that, so hearing the coronation ceremony in crowning ceremony of thomas shadwell dullard from every nook and corner came to nursery in england i told you nursery is a very disreputable or uh, notorious place hmm, famous for these inept actors writers etc so all those dullards from every part of the world came to that place to witness the coronation ceremony of thomas shadwell okay so you know the next thing a funny thing is uh, according to tom or john dryden uh, thomas shadwell has cheated so many booksellers because uh, he promised them by pro uh, he promised them uh, uh, that they will get a huge profit if they publish their books but in reality when they published his book they had uh, been in debt uh, because all his books hmm, uh, remain unsold okay so you know uh, or, uh, normally when when the, whenever there is a coronation ceremony or uh, yeah a uh, similar type of ceremony related with palace ch uh, church or any other function the way will be covered with red carpet isn't it the path will be covered with red carpet so instead of red carpet you know uh, the roads ways hmm, the path etc were covered with the unsold books of unsold books of thomas shadwell okay 
and the throne was i mean the very seat that very chair the throne was made of uh, richard fleckner's own volume both the son and the father uh, have so many unsold volumes of their books so uh, using those unsold books they have made the palace and the chair okay so you know crown prince thomas shadwell hmm? uh, he seated on the right side of the fleckno so you might have seen in movies and uh, soap operas where the coronated king will be sitting in the center and next to him his father uh, or the great grandfathers will be there similarly the uh, uh, crown he was crowned thomas shadwell was crowned next to him uh, there sits his father richard fleckno now it's time to take oath isn't it after becoming the king or after uh, yeah being in the position you need to take oath so anyway he, he has taken the oath that he will wage an immortal war against sense or indulgence he will not write anything uh, sensible in his work so you know next is anoint uh, anointing ceremony anointing ceremony means you know very, uh, some uh, holy oil or uh, yeah for that yes you know perfumes will be uh, yeah will be rolled on the head of the person to be coronated or the person in power so you know old king that is richard fleckno is uh, standing uh, with a mug of uh, wine in his left hand and a dull drama in his right hand so normally when a person is coronated or when a person is about to step into a, a position of importance he will place his hand on bible or quran or gita isn't it that is natural and of course he will uh, uh, he will the particular person will take oath upon his belief so here the case is different you know old king is sta standing with a mug of wine and on another hand instead of holding bible the person is holding his own dull drama so wine once you see we know that why do we drink wine whenever we want to immerse in the, um, what do you call literally things or lazy stuff we drink wine so like wine can put a person into yeah sleepy or in a dull mood so that is why the person is standing with the wine and instead of placing taking oath upon the bible here the person brings his own dull drama now the crown prince head was then crowned by chaplet of poppy leaves you know poppy leaf it's from poppy flowers and poppy leaves that opium opium is made okay opium is made uh, so we know that in ancient uh, greece all those winners heroes were crowned with laurel leaves laurel or olive leaves so instead of crowning him with olive and laurel leaves richard fleckno crowned thomas shadwell with poppy leaves hope you understood the fun behind the comparison he, instead of giving him laurel leaf he had crowned his son with poppy leaves so that will induce more dullness in him okay dullness and rosiness in his brain he will never deviate never ever deviate from the path of nonsense and soon after he became he enthroned he soon after he was enthroned 12 owls appeared in the sky 12 owls appeared in the sky okay so normally uh, as a omen as a sign from as a sign of approval from gods 12 owls appear so in movies you might have seen hmm? in yeah in historical or mythological movies you might have seen when when uh, whenever uh, hmm? a very heroic uh, whenever a legend uh, becomes the king or emperor of a throne hmm? emperor of a uh, place some kind of approval or omen will be seen in nature especially when rome was discovered by romulus hmm, and remus okay uh, it was uh, they discovered the land uh, among the seven hills hmm? and uh, when romulus became the king of romulus that's how the name come rome okay uh, 
eagles hmm, 12 vultures appeared in the sky so has to so has an approval oh, yeah uh, yeah that was taken as an approval from the god okay but here owl stands for stupidity and nonsense when thomas shadwell became the king of the nonsensical realm owls appeared okay now so all those people who gathered there they cheered their father hmm, and blessed the son hmm? uh, so both the son and father are now happy and you know they are they got blessing from the uh, crowd now now after coronating thomas shadwell now richard flecknow is giving set of advice and blessings to his son so he is giving some advice to his son let him not seek external inspiration and foreign aid and try not to pass off others writing his own but depend entirely on the powers of his brain so thomas yeah richard flecknow says to thomas shadwell that he should not depend on other writers he should never get insp inspired by the works of ben johnson or Shakespeare, Christopher Marlowe, hmm, or other eminent writers, you should never be deviated or deflected by other intelligent people. He should depend upon his own dullness. He should never astray from the path of stupidity and nonsense. Hmm? You should continue in that path. Uh, since he has no affinity with, yeah. So another comparison is Ben Johnson. You know, every person has their own um, role model. Hmm? Or, yeah, yeah. So, you know, Ben Johnson is an Elizabethan dramatist. Yeah, pretty famous for his wits, satires, mm, kind of black humors. Okay. So, anyway, Thomas Shadwell, uh, you know, he he read and enjo uh, enjoyed the works of Ben Johnson. According to Tom, uh, John Dryden, this person has plagiarized many of his uh, works in his uh, yeah, he has copied many of those eminent lines from Ben Johnson in his work. I mean, Thomas Shadwell. So he says that, see, you don't have anything to do with Ben Johnson. The only similarity between you and Ben Johnson is that you both have same formidable figure. Other than that, you people are different because Ben Johnson has never written any nonsensical thing. He's a master of sensical thing or uh, intelligent type of work. But you are entirely opposite, so you should never try to copy him. And uh, okay, even if you try to copy, it, it, that can be easily understood because that will form a, uh, you know, even even if Thomas Shadwell tries to copy uh, works from Ben Johnson or any other eminent writers, that can be easily identified because. You know, uh, when we try to mix oil and water, we know that oil will form the top layer and water will go down. Similarly, uh, your thing will float and their thing will be at the bottom because, you know, since their works will be full of rich, uh, intelligent or sensical stuff, it will go down. It has weight. It will go down. Yours being so shallow, you, you know, it will always float. So we can easily identify even if you plagiarized from them. Okay. <clears throat> so whenever this person has tried to write some serious stuff, it has always become comedies. And his comedies have always made the people cry. So this person is an utter failure. Okay. In indirectly, Dryden is saying that this person is an utter failure in every respect because whenever he tried to write his uh, comedies, that has always become a tragedy and tra all his tragedies have become comedy. So, yeah. So, this person is physically very big but intellectually very small, who oh, Thomas Sharpel. So, all his characters, you know, are uh, ineffective. See, Thomas Shadwell has written rehearsal, medal of John Bays, and so many fast ridiculing John Dryden. He says that none of those uh, satires hmm, are effective enough to harm, you know, John Dryden or on any other eminent writers, even though he has 
heart full of venom, heart full of poison, his satire hmm, is not that effective in harming writers. Okay. Now, he's asked, uh, Dryden says to Thomas Shadwell that, don't try to attempt mock epic satire or big, big epic works. You may try. Hmm? You may try to uh, you would exercise with anagrams and acrostics, wordplay, pun, etc. That is the best field. Actually, uh, who is giving set of advice to uh, Thomas Shadwell? Thomas Shadwell is now the king of nonsensical uh, realm. He has presented as, you see, this is a mock epic satire. So he has been given a, um, what do you call, uh, a position just like uh, an enthroned king. Hmm? And who is the old uh, king? Richard Flecknow. So Richard Flecknow is giving advice to Thomas Shadwell that you should never copy eminent writers like Ben Johnson and you should never plagiarize from them because it can be easily identified and because and you don't have anything to do with them. Uh, all your mm, works are full of uh, nonsense and you are the best one uh, who fits in this chair and uh, see, you should maintain it. And after, after uh, uh, giving him certain advices and he blesses his son, then he, Richard Flecknow, after doing all his duty, hmm, all his after fulfilling all his duties and responsibilities, he vanishes hmm, uh, into uh, hell. Okay, just like Elijah. Elijah is a mythical, not a mythical, biblical character, you know. Uh, yeah, when uh, Elijah went to heaven hmm? uh, after making his son Elisha, uh, Elisha, the next king of the uh, place, uh, you know, when he went up to heaven, what happened? The mantle, his dress, his robe fell upon his uh, son. Yeah, that person went up to heaven. So when he went up to heaven, his robe, you know, his mantle fell upon uh, his son who's sitting on in the room. Similarly, when Richard Flecknow went down, he, he, he hasn't been to heaven. Instead, he, he went down, okay? That means he went to hell. Uh, so when he went down, uh, the trap door, you know, the trap door from underground. Yeah, the trap door from underground opened. When it opened, gush of air, you know, uh, a gush of air uh, has pulled up his robe his dress and it fell upon the upon the Thomas Shadwell there there uh, upon confirming his perfect dullness. So uh, Richard Flecknow has extracted all his blessing, all his vigor, strength related with nonsense. Hmm? He has given all his nonsense as a blessing to his son Thomas Shadwell. Okay, so this is the most pungent sarcasm ever written in English literature. I've told you the theme is all about revenge hmm? uh, it's a kind of what uh, a conflict of uh, respect reputation cleverness competition in the field so there are total 217 lines okay uh, there are so many allusion mythical allusion parodies etc it's very interesting poem go through it so the next poem is Alexander's Feast by um, John Dryden. Okay, Alexander Feast or The Power of Music, 1697. Okay, that's a very, you know, another wonderful poem by John Dryden. So in this poem, it is an ode written by uh, written to celebrate the St. Cecilia's Day. So St. Cecilia is believed to be the originator of music. Or she is the one who discovered organ. Okay. And, uh, you know, St. Cecilia was uh, married off against her wishes. But uh, she, uh, yeah, she uh, has determined to be the server, the honest servant of the God. And she wanted to continue in her path. She was not into worldly life. And she had discussed everything with her husband. And, uh, you know, uh, yes. She is the first martyr. She is the first Christian martyr, okay? She is in Cecilia. And uh, understanding her divinity, her husband uh, allowed her to follow the life she 
wanted Saint Cecilia, okay. And Saint Cecilia is believed uh, to bring uh, the angels hmm, uh, upon earth, okay. Hearing her song, hearing her melodious song, uh, angels from heaven, she was able to <coughs> pull down to earth. So here there is a beautiful comparison because if Saint Cecilia has pulled down, uh, she, if, if, she, if she is able to bring that angels to heaven, uh, the Alexander Scott poet Timotheus, he is able to elevate an, a, a mortal being like Alexander to heaven. Okay, understood the comparison. One is backward, another oh yeah, forward and reverse type of comparison. Saint, Saint Cecilia bring angels upon earth. What has Alexander, King Alexander's court poet, he was pretty powerful to elevate an immortal, uh, not immortal, a mortal being like Alexander to heaven. So let's see. So Alexander's feast is a dramatic, you know, that is also a dramatic uh, verse. Hmm? Uh, yeah. So there are many mood change, tone changes in the poem okay at certain part we will feel pity then the readers will have the feelings of uh, not readers the character uh yeah are suddenly shifted to the mood of revenge hmm? so there are different types of uh moods and tones uh in the poem yeah so central characters of this poem are alexander the great Mm, then Thais, his mistress, and the Persian king Darius. Okay, Alexander's court poet or bard's name is Timotheus. He is the prominent figure. Mm, actually, Alexander is only an instrument in the hand of Timotheus, his court poet. And he is the one who praises him soon after his victory over Persian Empire. So, you know, just like Saint Cecilia brought angel to earth this person has elevated alexander to mm, heaven now so in the first stanza we can say that uh, timotheus glorifies alexander as a god mm? so let's see the first few lines from alexander feast a song in honor of saint cecilia's day i told you saint cecilia is uh, believed to be the founder of organ or the music okay it was at the royal feast for persia won by philip's warlike son a lot aloft in awful state the godlike hero stayed on his imperial throne his valiant peers were placed around their bros with roses and myrtles abound so should uh, desert in arms he crowned that lovely thighs by his side sat like a booming eastern bride in flower of youth and beauty pride happy 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 pair none but brave none but brave none but the brave deserves the fair so what has been discussed in the first set of line uh the <clears throat> john dryden says that uh see Persia, this person has recently won a battle against uh, Persia. Philip's son, Alexander's father's name is Philip. Uh, but he, yeah, Philip is the biological father of Alexander. But in mythology and all, uh, it is said that he is the son of Ammon, Zeus, isn't it? Well, uh, those people who are familiar with the history or mythology, maybe you people uh, might have heard about the story that he is the son of alexander is the son of zeus Ma ammon okay god like hero state because uh yeah so now uh, alexander is uh, sitting in his throne like a he uh, like a hero like a god hmm? next to his uh next to his seat uh there is thais his eastern bride you know she was his mistress and uh Timotheus, the court poet, is praising both the Alexander and his bride, Eastern bride, or the mistress Thais. So he says that only the brave deserves the fire, uh, fair. Okay, Alexander, yeah, is the is a synonym for hmm, bravery. Yeah, he's a synonym for bravery. 
or courage or all those kind of uh, terms that is associated with masculinity so only such type of a person deserves uh, a fair and a beautiful lady like thais okay so in the first stanza is first stanza is all about celebrating uh, uh, that the, the celebration of a persian uh, victory okay the second stanza in the second stanza yeah timotheus plays on high amid the tune of uh, full choir with flying fingers touch the lyre trembling note as in sky and heavenly joys in spear so in second stanza um, he may, uh, yeah he has given a musical performance in front of alexander and thais and he glorifies alexander and which contributes much to his pride hmm? he became very proud and see see he is the one who manipulates the feelings of alexander okay this person of timotheus the court poet hmm? he actually he is the real hero of the poem because he uh, he can easily manipulate the uh, what the mind of alexander so in the first poem he appreciates he praises um alexander his vigor his masculinity and the thais in second poem a uh, stanza he gives a musical performance in front of uh, them and he that, that that contributes much to his pride and what happens in stanza 3 in stanza 3 uh, court poet invokes bacchus bacchus means i told you dionysus god of wine festivity sex all kind of you know uh, things that can convince people and he encourages alexander to drink okay so and alexander has reached the height of what he calls uh, pride hmm? his pride his has heightened okay so when the timotheus understood that okay fine the person is now uh, head strong he shifts his tune okay then he uh, yeah draws his attention towards the dead king davius okay so the tune becomes sadder yeah uh so alexander you know he became quite sentimental so at first he is very happy then he became very pr- uh, proud then he became very sad okay uh, in stanza number 5 he praises the beauty of thais hmm? uh and her relationship with her okay now stanza number yeah apart from that yeah still alexander is down okay after turning his attention towards darius alexander is down even though he has praised uh thais so seeing uh, the king with uh king's heart full of regret you know darius again shifted or changed the tune of the or the tone of the music and he has called for the revenge you know why because persians deserve it hmm? they they deserve such an ending because several times hmm, lo- long ago or many uh, times this persian people have taken the life of many roman ancestors or roman people so what they have got is what they richly deserved okay so does he try to you know give confidence or give uh he tried to uh, rise the what do you call the very level of uh confidence in the mind of alexander okay so he shifted his music like that happy proud then regret like that so thereafter uh, he asked actually he compelled through with his song with his music he force he was able to manipulate alexander thais and all the people who gathered there and made them to set fire upon the uh, persepolis hmm? that is the capital of persia okay and uh, it needn't have to feel regret over that because you know they have done um, so many 
uh, other mistakes to Roman people. So what they got is what they deserved. Now, when he ends the poem, hmm, Dryden says that, see, the uh, Timotheus is compared to, uh, I mean, Roman Catholic martyr, St. Cecilia. Both are equally talented. Court poet Timotheus and Cecilia are equally talented. If Cecilia was able to bring angels to earth, this person was able to raise a mortal man to heaven. So that's all about Alexander's feast. Now let's discuss epistle to Dr. Albert Nott. Epistles to Albert Nott, Alexander Pope. Uh, I told you period from 1688 to 1744. Yeah, mostly 1700 to 1745. The period is known as the age of Pope. Okay, so he is the most quoted writer after Shakespeare. Okay, the greatest poet, one of the greatest poets of 18th century. Okay, uh, and he is also the most epigrammatic of all English writers. Epigrammatic. Uh, in Malayalam, we'll say it's Kashi Kurukia Kavitakal. Okay, epigrammatic. So he is best known for his satires, uh, just like Dryden. Mm, and the most popular mock epic in English literature is Rape of the Lock. Danciart essays on criticism mm, uh, are fam yeah, famous of his collections. He, like, just like Dryden, he too has translated works of ancient writers like Homer, Virgil, and Horace. Okay. He's popularly known as the imitator of Horace. Okay. The famous imitator of Horace because Alexander Pope has translated many works of Horace into English. Uh, yeah, just like Dryden, he too a uh, mastering heroic couplet. But it is Dryden who perfected it, okay? Now, so, yeah, just like uh, John Dryden, Alexander Pope was also, uh, you know, a public figure, very interested in politics. Mm? Then... Very headstrong, just like John Dryden. Being a learned person, he's also very headstrong. He used to ridicule, satirize all his contemporaries. Hmm? He belonged to the Scribblers Club. I told you, 18th and 17th century. Yeah, the, uh, the, the second half of the 17th century and the 18th century witnessed a lot of coffee houses and clubs. Okay, so this Alexander Pope belonged to the Scribblers Club. John Gay, John Nathan Swift. John Arbuthnot, Thomas Parnell. So these were the prominent members of the uh, Scribblers Club. And William Congreve was also there. Okay, William Congreve was a prominent restoration dramatist. And John Nathan Swift is the cousin of Dryden. John Nathan Swift, I hope you have heard about the name, the one who authored oh, Gulliver's Travel. Gulliver's Travel. Okay, so John Nathan Swift is the cousin of John Dryden. Mm, yeah. So, uh, he became a great success. Hmm? The I mean, Alexander Pop. Uh, he became a great success after the translation of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. His residence name is Twickenham. Please note it. Alexander Pope's residence name is uh, Twickenham. So, uh, he is a man of sh hmm? uh, four feet. Yeah, he's a very short person. Hmm? Is only somewhat four feet six inch, yeah, six inch. Okay, so that is why he is said to be a, a child of particular sweet temper. Hmm? Uh, even though he is very talented, hmm? uh, you know his temper. He was a sharp tempered person. Hmm? <coughs> now, let's see an episode to Doctor Albert Not. So, just like. Uh, Mac Fleck, no, he too has his own reason for writing an episode to Albert Nott. Uh, so this is this is a satire. This is also a satire. Uh, but he says that it is not a satire, but a bill of complaint. Hmm? Uh, it is addressed to Albert Nott. Not, he's not, uh, what, satirizing or ridiculing George Albert Nott because George Albert Nott is the best friend of Alexander Pope, and they are in the same club. 
but he is ridiculing other contemporaries and he says that it is a bill of complaints to uh, Albert Nord, just like a little child complained to uh, his or her parents. Similarly, Albert Nord being the best friend of Alexander Pope, he is complaining about other, people's, uh, other uh, people uh, to him. And this person is the official physician of Queen, Queen of England then. Okay. Uh, then he says that he has seen ridicule or satirized uh, that um, normal people or common people in his uh, work, but he has satirized only those vicious, malicious people in this work. So uh, other people, um, yeah, who live with a good intention, hmm, they don't have to worry about his work because he hadn't attacked them. He had attacked only those people whose heart is full of venom, especially Lord Harvey, Lord Lady Waterley, Mundake, Joseph Addison. Uh, these are the some of the prominent uh, contemporaries of Alexander Pope. Okay, so these people have been severely criticized in uh, epistle to Dr. Albert Knott. And there is an, another reason behind criticizing Lord Harvey and Lord, Lady Waterley, Mundake, you know, uh, actually, at first, Lady Waterley Montague and Alexander Pope were two good friends. After that, Alexander Pope fell in love with uh, Lady Waterley Montague. She's such a beautiful lady uh, of a boxing health and height. Uh, so this person, we know that uh, he is not that physically fit. Okay, Alexander Pope is not that physically fit. Very deformed figure, uh, man of short height. Hmm? So he proposed Lady Waterley Montague. So, you know, she didn't expect that advance from Alexander Pope. So she quickly uh, cut all her relationship with Alexander Pope because she only considered him uh, a best friend. Thereafter, she went and joined Lord Harvey. So that became a really shock to um, Alexander Pope. And, uh, you know, uh, these people, Lady Waterley Montague and... Lord Harvey, they have written uh, a verse hmm, against Alexander Pope uh, titled Epistle to Doctor of Divinity from a Nobleman at Hampton Court. Okay. And Joseph Edison, another prominent poet of the spirit. So, so he has, you know, so many 400, around 400 characters are there in Epistle to Doctor of but not. So it is a direct upon those people who has pestered or tortured the very peaceful life of Alexander Pope. So, yeah, he has uh, maintained, he has modeled the tradition of Roman poet Horace in all his works. Okay, now let's discuss the poem. Shut, shut the door, good John, fatigue. I said, tie up the knock, uh, knocker, say I'm sick, I'm dead. The dog star rages, say it's uh, past a doubt. All bedlands so of partners is let out. Fire in each eyes and papers in each hand. They re reside madden around the land. So, yeah, so when the poem opens, he has already taken a, what do you call, a bail or a, what do you call, um, an excuse from the readers hmm, saying that, see, this paper is a bill of complaint, which I've started writing many years ago and still kept on writing and have decided, finally decided to uh, publish uh, only because the attack upon him and his family has reached the has passed the limit and now he has now he cannot control his anger anymore that is why he has written such a uh, pungent sarcasm okay thereafter he starts the poem shut shut the door good john good john is servant uh, john is a servant of alexander pope so alexander pope is the narrator of this poem he is he himself is the narrator of poem i is alexander pope okay he says to his, uh, servant john please go close the door shut the door see i'm sick i'm dead so so many people so many poet asters inept writers and all those people uh, who are living for the sake of their stomach are knocking the are knocking at Alexander Pope's door. Hmm? So he says that please shut all the windows and doors and whoever approaches uh, his house, please tell them that he is sick or he is even dead. So he is wondering why all these people are running to his house. Hmm? Uh, according to Alexander, all those people who are, who are coming 
to his house are madmen. Hmm? They are coming from Bedlam. Bedlam is a mental asylum in England. So in uh, in in his view, these people are mad. Hmm? These are directly running from the mental hospital. So he is wondering whether the dog star has risen. Normally in Malayalam and all during the month of October, yeah, October, September, we say that it's a particular uh, season where dogs mate, isn't it? The mating season of dogs or particularly during that season, dogs will uh, will become insane or something like that. So he's wondering whether it is a uh, season of dogs or the dog star has risen in the sky because these people are rushing towards, towards him. Fire in each eyes and paper in each hand, they rave, recite, and madden around the land. So all these, uh, so these people, he can see fire in each of their uh, eyes. Mm? They are reciting, raving. Mm? So in in some Malayalam uh, movies, you might have seen those uh, inept writers uh, who wanted to get published their poems or uh, release their poems or. Uh, or to get an entry in films and all, uh, they will approach other famous writers. Similarly, during those times, uh, it was mandatory or that was a need of the time that you need uh, to get a supporter or a patron. So Alexander Pope, um, being a noble man hmm, of good rep reputation, uh, they think that you know uh, he can con help them considerably by recommending them to the king or queen or writing a preface to their poetry or work. That is why these people are approaching him. What walls can guard me? What sheets can hide? They pierce my pickets, uh, though my grot they glide. By land, by water, they renew the charge. They stop the chariot and they board the barge. No place is sacred, nor the church is free. Even Sunday shines no Sabbath day to me. Then from the men walks from the man of rhyme, happy, happy to catch me at dinner time. So he says that no wall, no door, nothing can hide me from these poet asters because these people, you know, they don't have any kind of discretion or sense of, uh, what do you call? They are so oblivious. They don't, they are not at all bothered about other people's uh, privacy or kind of things, you know. They come anytime through any way, by line, by water, even if he is going to church, uh, even church is not a sacred place for him. You know, they will come there also. Uh, uh, and some people are even happy to catch him during dinner time. And whenever this person is eating, then certain per uh, some persons will come because they are starving. They wanted to have something. If they come during the dinner time, then they can have, uh, have, uh, dine with him. Isn't it? Now, is there a parts and much being used in beer? And one of the poet is a drunkard. Hmm? A modeling poet, a rhyming peer. Another one is a, you know, a sentimental poetess. Hmm? Another person uh, is a heartbroken poetess. Another one is a rhyming peer. He has a, a, a rare disease of writing, rhyming poetry, hmm? rhyming poems. Then is a clerk. Hmm? He doesn't want it to become a clerk, but due to his father's compulsion, he had become a clerk, but his original, uh, you know, hmm, uh, what do you call aim is to write poetry who pens a stanza when he should win gross he's there who clock from the ink and paper uh, scrolls with the spray charcoal around his darkened walls so alexander pop is praying to god oh can anyone please lock ink and paper uh away from them please lock ink and paper so that they will mm, never write poetry in their life so again he says that there is no point in uh keeping ink and paper away from them because they are so desperate hmm? Uh, because these people are really mad. Once they, uh, once the ink and paper have been taken away from them, you know, uh, they will have withdrawal symptoms. So they will even use charcoal to write poetry upon the walls. Hmm? All of them will uh, fly to Twickenham. Twickenham is the residence of Pope, okay? They are flying to me. Oh, they are killing me to keep them mad or vain. Arthur, whose gibbies and neglect the laws, imputes to me and my damn works cause. So, you know, uh there are certain hello uh there are certain people uh who blames pope hmm, sorry who blame pope for uh for the you know one there is a person called arthur hmm, uh whose son wanted to be, uh, write poetry because but he wanted to make him a lawyer okay so he uh, uh, the person the particular person blames pope 
for, uh, for his son following him. And another one, my damn work caused Pope Coronas, his frantic wife, Elope. Then another person named Parna, Cornus hmm, blames Pope uh, because his wife had eloped with another man hmm, after reading Pope's poetry. Actually, he is indirectly praising himself that because after reading these men, uh, these people have become really intelligent. Uh, that is why one lady has left her husband and went with some other person and another man you know, neglected his studies and decided to become a poet. So all these people, hmm, whoever ha uh, has read the poem of Pope, have changed their intention. Okay, indirectly praising himself. Friend to my life. It's friend to my life means Albert Knott. Okay, Albert John Albert Knott is none but his best friend. It is to him he complains about all these people who are troubling or who are pestering him. Okay, which did not you prolong. The world has wanted, uh, wanted my an idle song. If you were in there, the world would have been got rid of my poems. Okay, see, see, see. Uh, you know, the person is quite uh, brandishing or self, uh, he has a rare disease of self-promotion. Self okay. What drop or nostrum can this plague remove or which must end me a uh, full wrath or love? So he's asking the John Albert Knott, do you have any kind of medicine or any drop which can keep away all these fools or mad poets? I am in a dire dilemma. Either way, I'm sped. Okay. See, I'm in a such a fixed situation. I don't know what to do. Hmm? I don't have any option. Neither way, I am trapped. If fools, that means if enemies, they will write against me. If friends, they may read to death. He cannot make any person his enemy or friend because if they are, if they turn to be his enemies, then then they will write against Pope. If they if they cons okay if they consider him, if they consider Pope um, their friend, then they will read him to death. They will write some poetry and they will um, sit and um, uh, yeah, they will make the Pope sit and hear their poetry. Either way, he will die. See, he's tied down to judge how rich die. So he will be tied down to the chair and he will be made to uh, sit there for a long time hearing the wretched poetries. Oh, come on, who can't be silent? Who will not lie to laugh where want of goodness and of grace and to be grave exceeds the whole powers of face? I sit with sad civility. I read with honest anguish and aching head and drop at last but in unwilling ears. The saving counsel, keep your peace for nine years so these poets you know these inept uh, poet pastors they will make they will tie pope to the chair and uh, they will make him listen to their wretched poetries so pope says that it is you know impossible to sit with a civilized hmm, uh, face because who no one can sit with a civilized face because hearing those uh, nonsensical stuff you know uh, all powers of face will exceed. He cannot laugh in front of them. Because if he laughs in front of them, they will think that he is ridiculing them. And if he criticizes them, then they will become really mad. So in either way, he cannot say he's trapped. So what he does is he will tell them, okay, keep your peace for nine years. This is a counsel given by, advice given by Horace. Uh, see, your poetry is good. But, you know, you have to work a bit more. Keep on writing for nine years. Maybe it will be matured. So that is the common advice that Pop gives to people who, are, uh, who approach them. Yeah. <coughs> so we have seen the first one, uh, lines from 1 to 68. Okay. Now, the second part of the poem uh so he talks about other people like Holly cyber harley bavis bishop philip sappho hmm? sappho is none but the first female critic hmm? so here lady waterly montague has been presented as sappho because he cannot use the direct name of those people right so ancient mythical right uh, not mythical ancient writers hmm? uh has uh they have been uprooted and they have see present contemporary <clears throat> contemporaries of Pope 
uh, their name is not directly discussed. Instead, they had been given the name of ancient writers. So Sappho is the first female critic. If you are studying literary criticism, you might have learned that Sappho is the first female critic. So Lady Waterley Montek has been given the image of Sappho. And uh, yeah, he's ridiculing uh, Sappho, Philip, Bishop, Harley, Polly, Cyber, etc. So he advises, <laughs> so whenever he uses the exact name of people, uh, Albert not became really scared and advises Pope to be prudent. Hey, be wise, don't discuss the actual name of the people that may uh, infuriate them. So Pope says that it is impossible to remain quiet. Okay. Uh, all right. <clears throat> now, from part, part three, lines from 125 to uh, 146. So here Pope talks about, here Pope is defending himself, justifying himself, why he has started writing poetry. See, other people are, uh, so many people are writing poetry and approaching him and killing uh, him by re making him read their poetry. And Pope says that, see, uh, you know why I have started writing? Just because hmm, no one has compelled me to write. Hmm? I don't have any, comp uh, uh, you know, compulsion. See, you know, Many of my well-wishers like Swift, Branville, Congreve, uh, Arbutnard, hmm, those people have requested him to write. Hmm? He has never written any uh, poems, to, so has to uh, convince his lover, wife. Hmm? Any, any. He hasn't written any law-themed poems. Okay, he has uh, written for the sake of his friends and those people who love him. Hmm? And you know, uh, he has got this gift in a tender ear tender age okay he's not writing for the sake of his stomach unlike other people he's writing for the sake of his friends and people who loved him okay now fourth part lines from 147 to 260 so yeah so he says that uh, there are people hmm so happy to catch him during dinner time. Some wanted to improve their financial status. Some wanted to get their copies sold. And um, some wanted him to introduce them to the king and queen. Some just wanted to eat the dinner. That is the reason why people are approaching him. Okay. Uh, then Pope again satirizes uh, the contemporary poet like Ambrose Philip. Hmm? Ambrose Philip is a... Play, plagiarist, you know, this person has earned a hmm, uh, considerable amount of money by translating uh, Greek works to, into English. Actually, none of his copies are original. Then he, uh, you know, uh, criticizes Joseph Edison. Actually, Joseph Edison is not an inept writer, okay? He's one of the famous writers of 18th century, especially essayist. Okay, Tackler and uh, spectator you might have heard about tackle and spectator uh, joseph edison edison published published uh, tackle and spectator along with uh, steel okay edison and steel very famous he's a good writer but you know uh, he lacks the courage you know whenever uh, other people approached him he remained silent okay and he always wanted to dom uh, dominate the literary world and the Pope calls Addison a coward because he doesn't have the courage to give the direct or exact <coughs> comment to people who approach uh, yeah, him. Okay. Now the next person is Lord Halifax. You know, Lord Halifax is the, uh, actually he's indebted to Lord Halifax because th that person has really helped him in getting rid of so many poet asters. So this Lord Halifax, you know, he sponsors or he's the patron of many other poet asters. And uh, do you know why he sponsors and uh, patronizes them? Because they flatter him. Hmm? Poet asters, he, he loves all those people who praise him. Now, part five, 261 to 304. Uh, poet says, hmm? uh, he justifies his family. There is another reason why he has written the poem, Episode of Dr. Albert. Now, he says that if it was, uh, see, if th these people only ridicule 
uh, pope he would have forgiven them he had decided to keep uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, write this pungent sarcasm just because these people uh, yeah, he even haven't uh, spared his family that is the reason why he has written the episode of dr abbot not okay so he says that you know he was living in a peaceful manner hmm? his father his mother everyone uh, were living in a peaceful way they have in uh, caused the death of anyone hmm? they have in changed the course of uh, life of any person okay they are basically honest and lived with a good intention now apart from uh, sixth part that is line from 305 to 333 So Pope attacked Lord Harvey. Lord Harvey, under the name of Sporus, you know Sporus is the homosexual uh, sexual partner of Emperor Nero. You might have heard about Nero, who played the <clears throat> uh, liar while the Rome was burning, isn't it? So he's the person. So yeah, he has been given the name of Sporus. I told you, Sporus is a homosexual partner of Emperor Nero. So he uh, see. Lady Waterly Montague has been given the name of Sappho, the first female critic, and uh, Lord Harvey Sporus. It is with uh, him she joined. Okay, so when Albert not hears the name of Sporus, he starts sc scolding him because this person is very uh, near to Queen. Uh, and there is another reason why he, you know, he criticizes Lord Harvey. One is the sexual jealousy. Yeah, because he has taken away the lady uh, he loved. and another reason is uh, he is very close to the queen and this uh, according to uh, alexander pope lord harvey and lady waterly montague they have plague they have poisoned the ears of uh, queen and turned the queen against the pope and john albert not so he calls uh, lord harvey a sp sporus hmm? sporus uh, a man who drinks the milk of donkey hmm? that is a sexual connotation he is a capable of hmm, this see this person even though he is very wrathful hmm, but he he can even kill a butterfly hmm? he is so powerless he is actually a castrated one not a masculine uh, not a man but a castrated person and uh, yeah he will say anything uh, to please people at court and in government Uh, that means he his spine is so flexible yeah in order to claim the social ladder he will do anything and uh, he says that lord harvey is also homosexual hmm? uh, you can see um, everything in him hmm? he uh, he combines he comprises both man and woman in him now the seventh part 334 to 140 yeah sorry 419 so um, the final part is the self portrait again he is justifying himself his friend okay uh, pope says that hmm, uh, pope has never pope has uh, see pope is never a worshipper of money that is um, yeah fortune is not a uh, amen okay is quite bold and courageous and he has never try to praise or uh, please anyone hmm? uh, he attacked his enemies hmm? Be just because they forced him to do so uh, and he is basically having a very sweet temper not like uh, what other people says that uh, he is an even tempered person no he is not like that actually his parents have given him a very uh, good life hmm? they have brought him up in a good, good way Uh, and both his parents were peace loving and they lived and died in a very peaceful manner okay similarly pope uh, wished to lead a uh, similar type of life okay and he at the time when he wrote this poem episode of dr arbert not arbert not was in uh, was bedridden he was not that uh, healthy so when he closes this poem he says that let god bless arbert not and his mother to have a long life long happy peaceful life okay 
that's all about episode of dr arbat now it's pretty easy you know uh, even though the satire the language everything is bombastic in style uh you will really love it if you start reading mac flecno and uh episode dr arbat now but before that you need to know the background or the historical background of the historical and the political background of the poem then only you will be able to understand why certain people have been uh, criticized under certain names uh, because here joseph addison ha had been criticized under the name cato 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 is the first uh, cato is the roman general okay and sappho lady waterley mundake hmm? sporus lord harvey so all these people are pretty famous <laughs> prominent figures of the 18th century hmm? they were contemporaries of john right uh, sorry uh, alexander pope so he cannot use their were uh, names as it is that is why uh, he had given them names from uh, ancient times okay so that's all about the, the fifth block we have completed okay then next week we can start with block 6 we will discuss the poems of william wordsworth william wordsworth and samuel taylor coleridge Okay.